Hello and welcome to part 3 of our core wall design series. Now let's start looking at the shear flow in our section and that is the method that we use to essentially calculate how much shear force is going between the joints of the core wall over here. Obviously if it's an in-situ concrete and it's cast monolithically you don't need to worry about that because it's going to be able to transfer these forces if it can actually withstand them in shear. That problem is not present in in-situ concrete. It really comes up when we are doing precast concrete and we have four different panels that are basically separated and we want to connect them together on site. And we want to know how much is the force that we need to design for in this connection. That's when our shear flow theory comes into account. All right, so let's start to look at that. Now, our shear flow equation that we should always keep in mind is that our shear stress is equal to our design shear force multiplied by the first moment of area and divided by your second moment of area multiplied by the thickness of that joint. Um, and that is basically a stress if you want to calculate it as a force instead. So your shear force is actually your design force which is a transverse force. So let's talk about transverse and longitudinal. Transverse is the force that's basically going in the horizontal plane. Longitudinal is basically the force that's going up and down at this joint here to be able to transfer the tension and compression forces to the flanges that we spoke about earlier when we were designing our flexural design. So this is our longitudinal shear force is equal to our transverse shear force multiplied by our first moment of area divided by second moment of area and basically the T cancels out because it's no longer a stress and you need to multiply it by the joint height or the joint length whichever you want to call it in this case. So let's look um, first let's understand how the shear flows. So if this is our center here with basically no shear we've got our shear forces flowing out from the flanges and they're getting bigger and here is the big concentration all the way until it goes back to the shear center of our wall here the same thing goes around until it goes down over here so if we've got a total force of 600 that means we've got a 300 kilonewton going through this way and 300 kilonewton going through this way um, and based on that we know that our design force is then 300 kilonewton for that joint. Now the second question is how we work out our first moment of area or what is known as Q. First moment of area is really simple. If you're trying to work out the shear force at this joint over here, basically this is the area that the shear has to travel from the center of the flange to this joint over here, which is equivalent to um, this was 3.3 meter, so if we take half of that, it's basically 1,650 millimeter times by the 180 thickness. So this gives you the area over here, and the moment of the area is basically taking the center of this down to the centroid of the section, which is half of our 2,700, which is 1,350. So in this case, our first moment of area is the 1650 millimeter multiplied by the 180 thickness millimeter multiplied by my lever arm which is 1350 millimeter so that is my first moment of area now my second moment of area i've already calculated it previously when i was working out my flexural stresses which is 2.767 times 10 to the 12 and now what I'm left with is my height so this is basically the overall height of my core wall because if you think about it if this is my core wall and I have a lot of floor slabs and at each level I basically have a horizontal force going into the core wall this horizontal force transfers into longitudinal shear and it basically keeps stacking up until it reaches the 600 kilonewton at the bottom. You can take it floor to floor, but that would be conservative, um, except only in few cases where 
you have a sudden huge shear reversal and that is common in um, outrigger systems or when you have a transfer floor that's taken a bit of your overturning moments out of the core wall or also when you have a basement and you have the basement retention taking your overturning moments from the core it's common to check it just for this one floor only in this situation but generally you can just take it throughout the whole building height so in this case I'm gonna assume it's 2800 millimeter per floor and let's say I have four floors of the building so that's my total length which is from the top of the core to the bottom of the core. That is my shear interface transferring all of my transverse shear into longitudinal shear. By the way, if you're interested into going deeper into lateral loads analysis and design, as well as modeling a complete full building on the finite element analysis software called eTabs, you can check out the links in the description of the video below. There is a full course that I've prepared on Udemy and you can access it with the link below for a heavily discounted price. So if you work that out and you convert this to Newton, you should be getting something like 487 kilo Newton. And basically this 487 is the force that I need to transfer at this joint. And it's gonna be the same at this joint because it's perfectly symmetrical as well, as well over here and over here. So in this case, this 487 kilonewton, I'm going to have to transfer it either with a wet joint with reinforcement or I can transfer it with weld plates. Obviously, weld plates is a cheaper option if you're using precast um, because it doesn't need to be formed on site and you don't need the reinforcement. It's much easier just to put a plate and weld it. And based on the thickness of the plate and the length that you specify, you should usually be getting about 200 kilonewton per plate. So a 487 force is really small. In this case, we only need three plates along this interface throughout the four story building that we're looking at hypothetically in this example. Now we've checked it in the Y direction again. You can practice with checking it in the x direction and calculating how much is the longitudinal shear force that you're going to require using the same assumptions that i've made and i'll leave the answer in the video description if you like this video and you've learned something from it please give me a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel for future videos and feel free to share it with someone that could learn and benefit from it as well Stay awesome and see you in the next video.